Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Fox, and I am with Lakeview Health. I'm the Director of Marketing here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today so that um, we can talk to you a little bit more about GTAC, the who, why, and how. Casey Factor is here to present this topic for us today. I want to go through just a little bit about Lakeview Health before we get started. Um, so Lakeview Health is a dual diagnosis addiction treatment center with locations in Jacksonville, Florida, and the Woodlands, Texas. Uh, the Woodlands, Texas is just north of Houston, for those of you who don't have that geography. Today we're at our Jacksonville campus. We're coming to you live from Jacksonville. In Jacksonville, we have a gender responsive facility, meaning that the men and the women actually receive treatment in separate facilities that are designed um, using particular programming and curriculum that address each gender's unique needs. We offer a continuum of care from medically monitored detox through an intensive outpatient program here in Jacksonville. Our board certified physicians partner with our licensed and master's level clinicians to develop comprehensive individualized treatment plans to help people set a new course in health and recovery. At Lakeview Health, we are a licensed Joint Commission accredited facility, and we are also members of NACAP and NADH. A little bit of housekeeping right before we get started and I introduce our presenter today. I want to let you know questions are welcome. You'll see in the right hand side of your um, menu, you'll have a question box. Please go ahead and enter questions in there, and at the end of the presentation, we'll go ahead and address those questions. We appreciate your feedback. Within about an hour after the webinar concludes, we will go ahead and send an email that, call, that is titled follow-up. If you can open that up and fill in the evaluation to let us know what you thought about today's webinar, that would be really helpful for us in planning future webinars. And then also included in that email will be a post text. If you can go ahead and complete that, at the end of the post test, you will have the ability to download a certificate from today. If you missed that opportunity, don't worry. We will also be sending out a certificate within the next 24 to 48 hours for those who have attended. Um, just a quick note, in order to get a CE, we do need people to attend live for 45 minutes or more. We have one more upcoming webinar for 2018, and that will be with our chief, our corporate chief medical officer, Dr. Kaplan, and he'll be talking about the recognition and treatment of dual diagnosis. So on to today's presentation. We do have today uh, Casey Sasser. She is the Senior Director of Medical Services. She's been working with individuals with addiction and mental health disorders for over a decade and has over 20 years of nursing experience. Casey is a certified family nurse practitioner and a certified addiction registered nurse. So I'd like to welcome Casey. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I want to start with that I have no disclaimers. Except for my promo for like you help, of course. Um, the, the objectives that we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be defining addiction, defining substance use disorder, um, talk about a few screening tools for substance use disorder, but the big topics of today will be recognizing intoxication and overdose, particularly from alcohol, sedatives, hypnotics, and opioids. We'll also talk a little bit about management and detoxification of alcohol, sedatives, hypnotic, and opioid withdrawal. And then of what we do here at Lakeview, I'll also go over a few of the protocols that we use. So defining addiction, according to ASAM, American Society of Addiction, addiction is a primary chronic disease. Was it always classified disease, as a disease, but it is now. It's a disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Dysfunction of these circuits lead to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and a release by substance use and other behaviors. So what I always teach, especially nurses, um, addiction is continuing to use despite negative consequences. That's like one of the main things. Once, once they get that definition, we can roll everything else into it. 
It's always characterized by inability to, to consistently abstain, impaired behavior control, cravings, some other things. Um, other chronic, like other chronic diseases, addiction often involves cycles of relapse and remission. Um, we wish that we could just fix some people in one time, but unfortunately that's not how addiction works because it is a chronic disease. Um, without treatment or engagement in recovery activities, usually addiction is progressive and can result in disability or premature death. And I think there's a lot of information on the news right now in premature death. We talked um, hugely about the opioid epidemic, the number of over overdoses that have increased dramatically over the last few years. So we're all pretty familiar with the premature, premature death topic. The definition of, the substance, of a substance use disorder, and this is according to SAMHSA, it's defined as a mild, moderate, or severe disease use disorder to indicate a level of severity. It's determined by the number of diagnostic criteria, which we'll be going over in just a minute, met by an individual. Um, substance use disorders occur when the recurrent use of alcohol or drugs cause clinically and functionally significant impairment, and especially with health problems, disability, they can't meet major responsibilities at work, school, or home, and substance use disorder is based on evidence of impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and pharmacological criteria. A couple of times people always ask me, well, how do you know when people are better? Well, again, addiction is a chronic disease, so we have to look at that. But there are two things that the DSM-5 explains when a, when a patient can be described as substance use or use disorder in early remission or sustained remission. They have to be three months or more without meeting any criteria excluding cravings to be considered an early remission and 12 months or more excluding cravings also to meet sustained remission. So there is the chance of remission, um, and that's how it's defined. So to go a little bit more into what use disorder looks like when you're looking at criteria and you're diagnosing someone with that, here we have a list of the manifestations that you see. You have to have at least two of the following within a 12-month period to be considered a use disorder. So we're gonna go over these opioids. So I picked opioids because it's such a hot topic so people can kind of look at that one. Opioids are taken in larger amounts or over a longer period of time than was intended. There's a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control the opioid use. A great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain opioid, use the opioid or recover from its effects. Craving or a strong desire or urge to use opioids. Um, recurrent opioid use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, or home. Continued opioid use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by the effects of opioids. So again, we've already started talking about those. Despite the negative consequences, people continue to use. Important social, occupational, recreational activities are given up or reduced. Recurrent opioid use in situations in which it's physically hazardous continues. Um, continued opioid use despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exacerbated by the substance. And then two things we're going to further talk about are tolerance and withdrawal. Back to, before we get into tolerance and withdrawal, I want to talk about classifying the manifestations. Two or three symptoms is, is considered a mild use disorder. Four to five of these symptoms that we've talked about, one through 11, is a moderate and severe is six or more symptoms. So one of the questions that I commonly get asked is, how do you know it's not just dependence versus a use disorder? Well, dependence, you can still have tolerance, but people are not having negative consequences related to their use. You can take a blood pressure, a, a diuretic for a long period of time, and when you stop taking that diuretic, you have a rebound edema or swelling. So you are dependent upon that medication, but that doesn't mean you have a use disorder of a particular, a particular medication. So tolerance is defined by you need more of the medication to achieve intoxication or desired effects, um, and you have a markedly diminished effect with continuing the, the same amount of that particular medication. And then withdrawal, on the, on the other hand, is where you have a syndrome of developing withdrawal symptoms opioids or a closely related substance are taken to relieve or avoid the withdrawal symptoms. So we hear a lot of times from our patients that 
Um, they tried to stop using, but they couldn't because the withdrawal symptoms were so severe they continued to take. So uh, that's one of the identifying criteria for a substance use disorder. So how do we screen for substance use disorders? Um, this was a big one that came out over the last couple of years, expert, where a lot of people were using this particular tool in outpatient offices where you screened the patient. So you ask the patient about, are they using any risky substances? If they are, you could also, again, use one of the standard screening tools, and we're going to talk about one of those in a minute. Give a brief intervention. You talk to the patient about how this risky substance use behavior um, could affect their life, provide feedback and advice. And then you may need to refer to treatment. So expert is screening, brief intervention, refer to treatment. This is probably my favorite tool of all tools for substance use disorder. And it's short and easy. They added these two additional questions at the beginning, one and two, to make sure we included drugs in it, but the CAGE will fit for any scenario. CAGE stands for cut, annoy, guilty, or eye opener. If, so you ask the patient these questions, have you ever felt you should cut down on your use? Have people ever been annoyed or have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking or use? Have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking or use? And I ask them, have you ever had a drink or have to use first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or get rid of a hangover or withdrawal symptom? If you said yes to two or more of those things, it's probably really clinically significant. And then you want to continue your expert portion of the intervention. Um, this is a very easy, great tool to use. It kind of gets the conversation started. And most people don't even know you're screening them when you start talking about this. So this is a good tool to use. So different drug classifications, just so when I use some of these terms, you'll know what I'm, I'm referring to, depressant. Um, are alcohol, benzodiazepines, opiates, barbiturates, which are not used as commonly as they used to be, and then THC or marijuana. Some stimulants, cocaine, amphetamines, methamphetamines, PCP. Maybe I won't butcher these words. Hallucinogens and dissociatives, LSD, ketamine, DXM, that's the cough syrup. Designer synthetics, K2. And it's a type of ketamine derivative, APVB, MDMA, also known as ecstasy, and then inhalants. Inhalants are picking up the pace. Um, they're easily accessible. They're things that are breathed in, breathed in to give the user an immediate rush. Some of these things include that are very accessible, especially to children, teenagers, glue, paint thinner, dry cleaning fluid, felt tip marker pins, hairspray. Um, there's a classic one, whipped cream, the sensors they use after all the whipped cream is gone, it's called whip it. You might also hear the terms popper, smackers, rush, bolt, bullet. Um, and these are inhaled directly from the container a lot of times, sniffing or snorting. They can put the inhalant in a plastic bag and bring it in, breathe it in. It's called bagging. Or, of course, if you hold an inhalant soaked rag in your mouth, it's called huffing. So the first one we're going to talk about is alcohol. Um, as I was reviewing this presentation, I realized, man, I had a lot of information on alcohol. And, you know, opioid is such a hot topic now. I questioned myself about why I put so much in alcohol. But alcohol and benzodiazepines very cautiously have to be detoxed. Um, those are the two, of course, you know, the opiates are along with that. But alcohol and benzos do have much higher seizure risk. There are more complications that we see during withdrawal with those two particular drugs. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on alcohol in relation to detox than I do some of the other things. So alcohol, of course, um, ethanol is the intoxicating ingredient, ingredient found in beer, wine, and liquor, and it's produced by the fermentation of yeast, sugars, and starches. So when I really learned about how alcohol was made, I worked in the prison system. I was not in prison, but did work there. And we would have patients that would come to our infirmary that were super drunk. And when I first started working, I was like, how is this even happening? I mean, I got people bringing in and stuff. But they would actually make what they called pooch um, with fresh fruit, yeast, and sugar that they stole from the kitchen. They would put in the plastic bags in their trash cans 
tie up the, the plastic bag, hide it in the room, let it ferment, and then they would drink it, share it with the whole group. So it's not hard to make. It's easily found. Alcohol is everywhere. It's in every corner store, every restaurant. It's also a central nervous system depressant. It's rapidly absorbed from the stomach and small intestines to the bloodstream, and it's the most widely abused drug in the world. Um, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2014 showed that slightly more than half of Americans age 12 and up are reported being current drinkers of alcohol, 52.7% huge. Most people drink alcohol in moderation. However, of those 176 million alcohol users, 17 million have an alcohol use disorder. That's a very large number. So again, this is just a little bit more um, statistical data. There are 100, about 137 million current alcohol users. 65 million of those binge drink. What is binge drinking? So SAMHSA defines binge drinking as drinking five or more alcoholic drinks on the same occasion on at least one day in the past 30 days. The National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism defines binge drinking as a pattern of drinking that produces blood alcohol concentrations of greater than 0.08. This usually happens about after four drinks for women, five drinks for men over a two hour period. And then if you look at the red center, 16.3 million heavy alcohol abusers defined as drinking five or more drinks on the same occasion on each of five or more days in the past 30 days. So still almost seven, pushing 17 million people, um, heavy alcohol users. So what does alcohol intoxication look like? Most of you likely have seen somebody intoxicated at this point. Common things that you see are slurred speech, drowsiness, unsteady gait, strong smell of alcohol in the person. They may have impaired coordination or memory, impulsivity, possible aggressive behaviors, super elevated BAC, dilated pupils, decreased pulse and blood pressure. We recently had a patient that came in that um, she ended up being Baker acted because she was assaulting the staff upon, upon entry at the facility for admission. She tried to choke one of our nurses. She um, pushed one of the therapists. She was super aggressive, so possible aggressive behaviors. We sent her out. She was Baker acted. Three or four days later, she wanted to return to the facility, which she did. Um, so she had no recollection, recollection at all of assaulting any staff members. So you can see how alcohol intoxication can definitely make you do things you wouldn't normally do or don't remember. So as, they, as your BAC increases, of course, so does impairment. Um, starting with the lowest one at the bottom, mild impairment, you're going to have a little bit of speech problems, memory, attention, coordination, balance, impairments. I kind of look like this every day, so I don't know. <laughs> um, beneficial effects such as relaxation. And sleepiness, so you hear people say, I'm going to have just a glass of wine. That's what happens when you just have mild impairment. And usually that's below a 0.06% BAC. When you start moving into DUI level, I call it 0.08 or up, that's increased impairment. You have um, some aggression, speech and memory problems, attention, attention issues, coordination, balance problems, um, possible risk of injury to self or others, and some moderate memory impairment. And then as we go on up in severe impairment, 0.16 to 0.30, of course, you have all those same things. Of course, then you move into judgment decision making. But also, here's where the real medical pieces start talking, blackouts, amnesia, vomiting, um, possible alcohol poisoning, and loss of consciousness. When you get up to 0.31 to 0.45 BAC, this is considered life-threatening. You're losing the point of homeostasis in your body. People lose consciousness, um, life-threatening alcohol poisoning, and risk of death, especially trying to do any other functions other than sitting. So I get a common question sometimes, at what BAC do you send people to the ER? The answer is I have no definite answer on that. Um, I've had patients, I can always recall this one particular patient, she was an LPN. She came in with a BAC of 0.42, so you see that that's not quite, that's severe impairment, not life threatening. She was walking, talking to answer questions. She weighed about 120 pounds. She had been using for about 10 to 12 years. I want to think it was about a liter of de a day of vodka. Recently, she, she did great. We left her in the facility. We detoxed her in the facility. 
No problem. Of course, you know, she was sick afterwards, but she was not so cognitively impaired that she couldn't answer questions or things like that. Um, recently, we had a large male that came in. I would say he was probably around 300 pounds. He had a BAC of 0.28. He could not hold his head up, didn't make sense, um, was almost unconscious, like in and out of consciousness, out to the ER. So when people ask me, well, what BAC do you send people to the ER? I mean, it really is dependent on the situation, how much they used to drink, how much are they drinking now, how long they've been drinking, what their body mass is, and then there's the whole thing with genetic disposition, et cetera. How do we manage alcohol intoxication? Um, first of all, supportive. We want to prevent respiratory depression, and we want to protect their airway. And even when, when those things get comp compromised, as long as we get them respiratory and cardiovascular support, we can usually get most people back to a safe medical condition. Um, a lot of times also we'll consider if they're in a hospital setting, IV glucose and thymine, because if alcohol does impair gluconeogenesis, then you may need some additional supplements. I apologize, I had an itchy little spot on my nose, I keep scratching. Um, some other things. There really is no fast way to get rid of alcohol, and there's no great med to reduce the agitation since the, the patient's already intoxicated. So, like, sometimes people say, well, can you have them throw up? Can you use charcoal? What if they were on dialysis? There is no proven evidence that those things will help reduce it because once it's in the stomach and you've absorbed it, instead of metabolizing it out of your body, then you got to just wait it out. And for example, for Mazamil, we'll talk about that a little bit later, it's a benzoreceptor agonist. antagonist. It is not effective with alcohol intoxication. And again, agitation is really best managed non-pharmacologically. There's no great medication to give them, and they're already impaired. So adding medications to it can sometimes be more of a risk than just waiting it out. So who metabolizes alcohol quicker, men or women? Um, a little bit back about what happens in your body is this difference is due to variations in the amount of, of activity of alcohol dehydrogenase or ADH. This is the enzyme that's responsible for metabolizing alcohol. If you don't have much of this enzyme, what happens to it? The alcohol sits in your body and it's absorbed into the bloodstream. Therefore, your BAC goes up. So males have a highly active, fast form of ADH in their stomach and their liver. And the presence of ADH in the stomach of males can reduce the absorption of, of about 30%. In contrast, females have almost no ADH in their stomach. Consequently, females absorb more alcohol in their bloodstream. Additionally, the ADH in the liver of females is much, um, is much less active than the ADH in the, male, in the male liver. So if you're looking at comparing the two, men metabolize alcohol quicker. That means they get rid of it quicker. Um, Young or old, young people metabolize alcohol quicker because, you know, old people have less fat, less muscle size. Some take medications that interfere with the metabolism. So, again, it gets in there and it may can get um, intoxicated quicker. Um, and then Caucasians are Native Americans. This one, uh, I'm sorry, I'm too fast. Um, Caucasians can uh, metabolize alcohol quicker than Native Americans based on genetic differences, and Native Americans actually metabolize slower. So some other things to consider who's going to metabolize faster, their biological rhythms, exercise, their body build, mass, fat, lean muscle, um, history of alcoholism, and are they using any drugs such as antibiotics that slow alcohol metabolism. So alcohol withdrawal. Alcohol withdrawal begins about 6 to 24 hours after the last drink. So many people stay intoxicated for a couple hours after they drink, but once they stop, here we go into withdrawal. A lot of times withdrawal symptoms are based on how long they've used, again, body type, um, what they're using, their build, their age, race, sex. Their withdrawal can start before their BAC reaches zero. So we don't wait till they get into full withdrawal before they start before we start treating them. Sometimes their BAC is still 0.1, sometimes it's 0.08, sometimes it's 0.2, and they're already in withdrawal. 
some of the things that we look for in alcohol withdrawal are tremors of the hands or tongue. Um, you literally can have them stick their tongue out and it will look like it's vibrating. And they'll have usually about six to eight cycles per second of vibration. And then seizures with alcohol are common and typically occur within 48 hours. So one of the things that is very serious with alcohol withdrawal is delirium tremens, also known as DTs. Sometimes patients just feel like DTs is a terrible withdrawal. The DTs is more than terrible withdrawal. It is terrible withdrawal, but it also includes several other things. Um, first of all, DTs really need to be managed in a hospital setting because they can be life-threatening. They can occur about three to 10 days after the last drink, and they look like this, agitation, global confusion, disorientation, hallucinations, that's a huge one, the confusion and the hallucination, um, fever, hypertension, seizures, diaphoresis, and then autonomic hyperactivity, such as tachycardia and, again, the hypertension. Profound global confusion is the hallmark of DT. Mortality rate, 1% to 5% increases with delayed diagnosis, inadequate treatment, and concurrent medical illnesses. So if they have other things going on, then um, they're more at risk of death. So what happens from intoxication to withdrawal? It starts in the GABA receptors to the deficiency in the GABA receptors. So the effects of alcohol are exerted through GABA receptors. You have the sedation, muscle relaxation, increased seizure threshold. threshold. Um, chronic alcohol exposure, of course, leads to the adaptive suppression of the GABA activity. And when you take it away, absence produces sudden relative deficiency in GABA activity, including anxiety, increased psychomotor activity, and predisposition to seizures. Withdrawal hallucinations can also occur during withdrawal. Um, in mild withdrawal, they may experience perceptual distortions of visual, auditory, or tactile nature. Um, so too bright, it's too loud, there's tens of needles, everything is overly stimulated. And then frank hallucinations may develop in severe withdrawal. According to the Principles of Addiction um, Medicine book, Visual hallucinations, interestingly, are most common and frequently involving animals. I never knew that until I did this presentation. <laughs> um, auditory hallucinations begin as unformed sounds. I mean, a lot of times people will complain of clicking or buzzing, and then it will progress to voices. They could be of friends or relatives, but they are often accusatory in nature. You shouldn't do this. Why are you doing this? I mean, that's a lot of the things I hear all the time. My mom's getting on to me over and over again. I can hear her talking to me why well, I shouldn't be drinking. Um, and then I, tactile hallucinations may involve bugs crawling on the skin. So more with, with withdrawal hallucinations. Um, in milder cases of withdrawal, the patient's sensorium is otherwise clear, and the patient retains the insight that the hallucinations aren't real. So that's, that's good. If they, if they know, I hear the us, but I know it's not real, then it likely will clear up you know, after a period of time. Um, in more severe withdrawal, this insight is lost. They think whatever they're seeing or hearing is real. Um, withdrawal seizures, very important and very scary. Uh, the onset is usually eight to 24 hours after the last drink. And again, it may occur before the BAC is zero. Less than 3% pro progress to status epilepticus, but Alcohol is involved in 25% of status epilepticus, and that can lead to death. So that's like an ongoing seizure that you can't stop. Risk of seizures do appear to be genetically influenced. There is an increased risk in those with a prior history of withdrawal seizures, and there's an increased risk in those undergoing concurrent sedative hypnotic withdrawal. Um, interesting term, the kindling effect where you have an increased risk of seizures as an individual undergoes repeated withdrawal. So every time they go under withdrawal, the kindling effect occurs and you could have um, more seizures. A side note on hallucinations, um, Joanna just shared one of my clients, clients saw Smokey the Bear. Oh, that's me, animals. They're right on track, look was right. Um, alcohol withdrawal severity scales, a lot of facilities use this, some don't use it, 
some challenge have challenges with insurance companies using it. Um, the CEWA is a great tool, Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessments for Alcohol. These are, these are the severity scales that are probably the most extensively studied. They're document, they have documented reliability, reproducibility, and validity. So when you're scoring this form, if you have a score less than nine, it indicates mild withdrawal. 10 to 18 moderate, and greater than 18 suggests severe withdrawal. The higher scores are predictive of seizures and delirium. This is what the tool looks like. You can find it online. Uh, some of the things that you'll assess are nausea, common withdrawal symptoms that you see, nausea and vomiting, tremors, paroxysmal sweats, anxiety, agitation, tactile disturbances, auditory disturbances, visual disturbances, headache or fullness in the head, orientation and, and clouding of sensorium. Uh, I love that they put the questions on here beside it because it really helps guide people. So the pharmacolo pharmacologic management of withdrawal, of alcohol withdrawal, Evidence indicates that the cornerstone of pharmacologic management of withdrawal is the use of benzodiazepines with alcohol. So I would say probably 99% of most facilities that I've ever been around um, use some kind of benzodiazepine withdrawal I mean, treatment with, for alcohol withdrawal. Pharmacologic management of alcohol withdrawal, why treat with benzodiazepines? It's cross-tolerant with alcohol. It produces a similar effect of enhancing the GABA-induced sensation. And administration of benzos alleviate the acute deficiency of GABA activity that occurs with the cessation of alcohol. So your brain is, has all this alcohol in there around their receptors and use the benzodiazepines to re replace that. All benzodiazepines are similarly efficacious in reducing signs and symptoms of withdrawal. Um, here's a whole list what their half-life is, how fast they, they react. Um, most people use the slower acting um, and the slower acting and longer acting benzodiazepines. Rarely do you see Xanax or especially Xanax used for alcohol withdrawal. Um, a lot of times Ativan, every now and then Valium, definitely Oxazepam with your liver impaired, um, I have never seen tenazepam or clonazepam used. Longer acting agents, again, um, particularly chlorodizepoxide, also known as Librium. I'm going to use Librium for the rest of the presentation. These are more, pervasive, more effective in preventing seizures, providing a smoother withdrawal course. However, these do pose a risk for over sedation in the elderly and those with liver disease. Um, the shorter acting agents may be preferable. Librium has a half life of about 30 hours, where Ativan has a half life of about 20. So those two are pretty comparable. You'll see those used a lot, probably most commonly in, in settings for detox. Librium actually has active metabolites for up to 200 hours. So they're good long acting. Of course, the rapid acting benzo agents offer more prompt control symptoms, but there is a greater abuse potential with the rapid acting. So if you're in a controlled setting giving somebody benzodiazepines, then you know it's not that much of a risk. But if you're trying to detox somebody at home or somewhere else, um, definitely a greater abuse potential and very risky to not do it in your inpatient setting. Um, so again, more not pharmacological management, non-benzos, sedative hypnotics have, been, have not really been studied, and um, some benzos offer greater margin of safety with lower risk of respiratory depression, as well as overall lower risk of abuse. Phenobarbital, great drug, um, long-acting, cheap, still used in a lot of programs, and has a well-documented anti-convulsant activity, it's inexpensive, has low abuse potential. So it is a great drug to use for detoxing also. Um, I'm gonna skip through dose determination. You guys can read this. Beta blockers, other agents that you can use, beta block blockers and alpha adrenergic agonists are effective in decreasing the symptoms. Um, beta blockers, Commonly used maybe enderol and then the alpha adrenergic blocker clonidine is a great one. 
There is no demonstrated efficacy in reducing seizures or delirium, though, however, with things such as enteral or clonidine. Carbamazepine um, is used in Europe for alcohol withdrawal. I know y'all are probably getting a kick out of this. I saved the word withdrawal really long when you're from <laughs> South Georgia. I'm sorry. <laughs> Equal efficacy to benzos for patients with mild to moderate withdrawal. And um, it's a faster return to work, less stress, minimal abuse potential with carbamazepine. Other agents you can you can consider. Antipsychotics are not as effective. Um, they could lead to increased rate of seizure. They are often used for agitation, even though it's not best choice. We see Haldol used a lot, especially in hospital settings. Um, should never be used except in conjunction. Should never be used except in conjunction with benzodiazepines. And then thiamine. Real quickly, I'm going to hit on that. The standard dose of thiamine is 100 milligrams times three days. I do encourage anybody that has an alcohol patient going through detox to give them this thiamine. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Um, all patients with one of the complications that you often see are withdrawal seizures. So first seizure, you really should send them to the ER or to the hospital. They should be admitted for observation evaluation. Um, they need a neurologic exam, brain imaging, EEG, maybe a lumbar puncture possibly. If they had a previous history of withdrawal seizures with a clear history of withdrawal seizures, you probably don't need a full evaluation. Most can be treated in an inpatient setting. For Nikki's encephalopathy, there's a triad of triad of symptoms that you see with this. Mental disturbance, paralysis of the ocular of ocular movements, which is six nerve palsy, and a gait and stance ataxia. Um, this can be a very dangerous uh, complication, so you really want to make sure you're you're looking for this triad of symptoms. It's often an acute onset. Um, it can be a neurological emergency. So Recently, I treated this patient that um, was a 51-year-old that came in, he drank alcohol in college, he continued to drink heavily as he went through the military and his job. He was drinking about five to six drinks a day up to a half bottle of wine. Prior to coming into treatment, he had multiple falls. He fell at home, he fell at the airport. Um, he actually had a fall when he got here to our facility. Um, he had, when we, when we checked his breathalyzer, it was about 2.271, and which is pretty high. We sent him out to the ER because of this fall. He had a blood toxicology there of 0.435. So at, he had continued to drink as he was come to our facility, so the VAC was continuing to rise. He did have some symptoms of tremors and anxiety, but they ruled out everything. He was sent back to the facility about two weeks into it. He started having some fine tremors developed. And then about the next week, he developed these myoclonic jerks. Um, so we kept monitoring. He had all the standard detox, detoxing. And in my 10 years of working in addiction medicine, I've really never seen this. But, but five weeks into it, the, we were trying to get him an MRI. The myoclonic jerks were so bad that he could not even lay still for the MRI. We tried Ativan, which made everything 10 times worse. He was eventually admitted to the hospital. And guess what? IV thiamine treated it all. So if you ever have a patient in the situation and it's very, very uncommon, and it honestly was the first time I've seen it in 10 years. Um, and, and he had thiamine initially when he came in, as standard protocol suggests. But five weeks later, this guy developed Wernicke. Um, all better after the thiamine, no lasting effects. Um, other alcohol-related complications, managing delirium, really you need to send these guys to the ER. They often need to be admitted to the ICU. What do we do at detox, at, what do we do for detox at Lakeview? We use primarily a liverium protocol, the four guys with oxide. Um, it's about a six-day taper. If they have liver damage, we use Cirax. We, we usually supplement with clonidine to help with some of those other symptoms. Um, of course, the scheduled thiamine, and then we have a list of scheduled PRNs, everything from Baclofen, Dental, Phenergan, Acetaminophen, Ibuprofen, those kind of things, to help with some of the, the other symptoms that manifest. And then we would use we use Capra 
sometimes if we have a patient with a history of withdrawal seizures. So moving into sedative hypnotics. People often call these benzodiazepines, but we know they're not just benzos. Um, there are benzos, barbiturates, the 5-HTR agonists, um, beta adrenergic R blockers. There are some other ones like the antihistamines, clonidine, things like that. And then there's Z drugs, Zolpidem, and then those drugs. The sedative hypnotics are drugs that produce calm and relaxation. The sedatives specifically usually often see used for anxiety. Hypnotics, we use those to put people to sleep. So both of them depress the, the central nervous system, but hypnotics definitely more. Um, sedative hypnotics decrease excitement, exert a calming effect, effect, facilitate sleep. They're among the most widely prescribed drugs in the US. Uh, they stimulate the inhibitory neurotransmitters in the GABA receptors, which we heard that same term when we were looking at alcohol. I did look at one study that had, they were looking at an outpatient clinic, 494,000 initial patients um, who, who was prescribed sedative hypnotic therapy most commonly. People aged 45 to 64, female, white, and most commonly used for anxiety, mood, and sleep in that order. What does intoxication look like? Impaired balance, blurred speech, drowsiness, respiratory depression, decreased pulse and blood pressure, and impaired memory. Um, Benzodiazepines rarely lead to death when ingested by themselves. There's no considered lethal dose. Um, and a few deaths have been reported involving some of the short acting ones, like triazolam is the old halcyon. That's included in that group. Despite their safety, benzos are a major cause of overdose, overdose when ingested with other agents. Black box warning would be for morphine. Like you will see that everywhere if you've taken buprenorphine training, if you've ever administered buprenorphine and looked it up, you will see the black box warning, do not give with business. Again, managing this, maintain the airway, ventilatory support. Um, benzos also slow gut motility, so you have to kind of watch out for that. Sometimes they will use like a gastric levage when you have an overdose of benzos, unlike alcohol, it doesn't exist it. Flumazenil is kind of the competitive antagonist. It, it is fairly weak and doesn't work, work great, but they can use flumazenil to help try to reverse some of the effects of the benzos. Um, you do need to know that using flumazenil though has been associated with seizure and cardiac arrhythmias. So we have to be careful when we're using that. It's only given in a hospital setting. So how many times have patients told you they've heard this? Nonsense, as long as, it, as you take it out every day on schedule, you won't have to worry about addiction. Um, and then here we go, they're in treatment, right? Withdrawal can occur with high or low doses. When you look at a low dose continuation, if you've used a low dose benzodiazepine for four to six months or a high dose one for two to three months, you're probably going to see withdrawal symptoms. But those duration of use and duration of drug action kind of tell you what kind of withdrawal you're going to be looking at. Some specific symptoms of sedative hypnotic withdrawal are tachycardia, hypertension, agitation, hallucinations, ringing in the ears, GI symptoms, and then, of course, at high dose, severe withdrawal, seizures, delirium, and death. Um, four things or four levels of symptomology that can happen when benzos are removed. You may see the patient develop the same symptoms that they were actually taking the, the benzo for. They can have rebound, withdraw, rebound symptoms, um, a pseudo withdrawal where everything's magnified and they feel like it's way worse than it actually is, and then true withdrawal symptoms. Um, prolonged withdrawal has been reported in a small portion of patients following long term benzo use. I've seen most patients with prolonged withdrawal and patients that use long-term, long-acting benzos such as Clontin. Um, we've already talked about the GABA, the GABA sites. I'm going to move through this a little bit. Um, duration of acute withdrawal can be as long as 7 to 21 days for short-acting and 10 to 28 days for long-acting. Um, beyond one year of continuous use, duration of use becomes a less important factor. Tolerance develops and withdrawal as, as the longer you use them and withdrawal requires more aggressive medical attention in the short acting. 
So this is our world now. Oh, it's so great to have your cell phone. And then how terrible it is now when you don't have it. So um, patients with benzodiazepine withdrawal kind of feel the same way. I feel so great once I get it, but then once you take it away, it is magnified 10 times. Um, the percentage of alcoholics who regularly use benzos range about 29 to 33%. So that comorbid polysubstance use can be super high risk. Um, using anxiolytics peaks between the age of 50 and 65, with hypnotics most frequently in the oldest age range. People that are elderly usually have a very long, prolonged withdrawal. So it takes a long time to work with these patients and get them back. Um, women get it more often than men, we've talked about that. I've given you the substitution dose conversion. Again, we use commonly chlorid as epoxide at 25 milligrams. This is um, the dose equal to 30 milligrams of phenobarb if you want to use phenobarb instead. So tapering and substitution are the two best ways to um, detox somebody with sedentic use disorder. Um, tapering the best way or substitution with something like phenobarbital. And then reducing, we talked about tapering, gradually reducing the dose, dividing it up into um, multiple doses, three or four daily doses. Um, some adjunct withdrawal measures that you can take, uh, carbamazepine has been studied as an adjunct, adjunct. sodium valproate also is effective. Propranolol diminishes some of the symptoms. Clonidine is not great with benzo withdrawal, buspar, nor buspar. Trazodone does help some anxiety in the benzo taper patient. Of course, CBT is the best rate of success when you discontinue sedative hypnotic. Um, what do we do at Lakeview? Benzo phenol protocol, PRN clonidine. The standing orders again, so we use phenobarbital primarily. Keppra, if we have a history of seizures, um, we have considered a clonazepam taper. This is an extremely rare current, and I think in my 10 years, I've seen two people on it. All right, hot topic opioids. Um, derived from the poppy plant, we know that. They um, include synthetic prescriptions, methadone, oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, hydromorphone, buprenorphine. Of course, there are the illegal drugs such as heroin and the new one, fentanyl analogs like carfentanil, and then general analgesics. Um, opioids are derived directly from the opium poppy, this nice cute red flower. And then they're semi-synthetics like heroin, oxycodone, and then synthetics that we are man-make, methadone and fentanyl. What does it look like? Probably the most common thing people have seen, constricted pupils. Confusion, euphoria, unsteady gait, can't remember anything, impaired coordination, constipation, and respiratory depression. Most often, the mu receptor in your brain is involved, though it does affect mu, kappa, and delta receptors. Um, you see the sedation and the direct suppression of the respiratory center, which is what is so very dangerous with the use of opioids, happening in the mu receptor. So why is it such an overdose risk? Tolerance is one big thing, has significant effect on overdose. Um, tolerance to respiratory depression may develop slower than the tolerance to the euphoric effect. So people will continue to take for euphoria when it's re depression, depressing their respiratory system and they don't care because they're still trying to reach for that euphoric effect. Um, if a person was recently detoxed, had a period of absence, they are particularly susceptible to overdosing. Um, a lot of them go back out and attempt to use the same amount they walked in with, and your body wasn't ready for that. And then, of course, IV is the most risky for overdose, but it can occur with any routing administration. What do you see? Um, CNS depression, respiratory depression, constriction of the pupils, and if you're looking at the patient, look for needle tracks. If you have an idea that this person may be using or may have had an overdose, maybe overdosing. There is a classic triad that's published. It's coma, respiratory depression, and myosis. 
However, it's not, you don't always see all three. You know, this one particular study I quoted, in a series of 43 hospitalized patients receiving naloxone for opioid overdose, only two presented with the classic triad. I call this the rumor of the classic triad because I don't know that it's really that classic anymore. <laughs> what do you want to do for these people that overdose? Establish adequate airway, respiratory, and cardiac support. If you give Narcan, give them, send them to the emergency room. Why do we send them to the emergency room after Narcan or naloxone is the other term? It typically wears off in about 30 to 90, 30 to 90 minutes. And the person can stop breathing again unless more naloxone is administered. So if you don't have but one or two doses and it wasn't enough to push all those opioids off the receptors, then they're set up for respiratory depression again. So for this reason, it's safest to call 911 and have the patient taken for medical care. Um, most people are now familiar with Narcan nasal spray. Pure opioid antagonist knocks those opioids right off the, the, the receptors, um, reverses CNX effects of opioids. This is probably the one that's easiest to use. It is over the counter now for people to get. I'm not promoting Narcan nasal spray, but it is a fabulous tool for everybody that has addiction to have around. Um, Things that are more potent, like fentanyl or the longer-acting methadone, you may have to have repeated doses of this. So that's why they send them to the to the ER so they can get an IV infusion of naloxone. Um, the caution is this may precipitate opioid withdrawal. You're knocking all those opioids off the receptors. When they wake up, they might not be happy campers. So establish the need for ongoing treatment. Don't forget this piece. When you have somebody that comes in with opioid overdose, just because you reverse the overdose does not mean they don't need ongoing addiction treatment. We gotta still remember this is the main part of treating the patient. Um, acute withdrawal, you're gonna see the exact opposite of everything that happens when they're when they're intoxicated. GI distress, lots of diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, uh, hot and cold sweats, insomnia, muscle pain, joint pain. They have lots of just discomfort in general. Um, less, with opioids, here's the thing, we talked about this at the beginning, less likely, I'm not going to say die, but have morbidity, mortality issues related to opioid withdrawal than with alcohol and benzo where you have a much higher seizure risk. There is the relation of comorbidities um, when you're going through opioid withdrawal, which can lead to death. That is one of the things that should highly be considered. So this person's severe opioid withdrawal right here. Uh, at least they did still wear their boxers. Tachycardia, elevated blood pressure, pup pupillary dilatation, um, tearing, noses running. These people look like they have the flu. So when you see somebody in treatment, they say, oh gosh, I feel like I have the flu. It's likely to be able to draw the worst in it. Um, two studies that were done, just you'll hear the term protracted abstinence or pause post-acute withdrawal sy syndrome, people can have protracted abstinence syndrome for some studies say up to two years. This, these studies particularly say it takes about six months for your temperature, sleep, respiration, and weight to return to normal. And um, the other study says of at least six weeks up to 26 weeks for some of those things to return to, return to normal. So what do we do for opioid withdrawal? Um, safe environment, adequate nutrition, thorough evaluation. Inpatient versus outpatient, you should be considering, serious consideration should be taken in regards to if they have comorbid medical or psychiatric conditions. Um, rarely used in detox are opioid agonists. We treat specifically here with um, phenobarbital. Here's a great, some great information on a clonidine detox which has helped reduce many symptoms of opioid withdrawal. Um, it doesn't reinforce the, the use. It's not controlled, and there's minimal risk of diversion with it. And again, you can combine that with naltrexone also. Buprenorphine is often added to now to your opioid detox to help reduce symptoms short term, five or six days at the most, small doses, um, low risk of respiratory depression with that. And yeah, talk about that. Um, just a reminder about ASAM dimensions. Addiction rarely moves to recovery without further treatment. So I call detoxing the patient getting an oil change in a car with a slightly warped valve. 
It might help it for a while, but eventually the whole thing just goes kaput. So don't forget, they really probably need to look really into recovery treatment. And of course, there's always MAT, such as buprenorphine. It's always an option when appropriate. Question. Oh, look at that. Thank you so much, Katie. That was great. Uh, we actually already do have some questions, but if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the question box in the side panel. Uh, so these have been coming in throughout the presentation. Can a person be dependent on a substance but not meet the criteria for an SUD? If so, how do we assist those individuals to receive treatment since they do not have a diagnosis? So we talked a little bit about that in the beginning, about the difference in dependence and a use disorder. Use disorders, you continue to use, meet criteria despite the negative consequences. With dependence, you can take medications for a long time and have withdrawal. So the best thing to do is to ask your provider what you can do about if you're trying to get off or taper down and to not do that independently. And there is a difference. And they can be dependent without being a use disorder patient. Um, are hangover symptoms withdrawal? Are hangover symptoms of withdrawal? Are hangover symptoms withdrawal? Yes. I would say hangovers are symptomatic of withdrawal. Yes. Have GABA supplements ever been trialed in alcohol detox? Um, I do not know that answer. That's something I would have to look into. Not in our facility specifically, and the facilities I've been worked in, I have not used. Okay. Uh, Ashley asks, what about individuals who are abuse, alcohol, and benzodiazepine? How do you detox? So somebody that has is alcohol and benzo use, I think is the question. Mm -hmm. um, I, my rule of thumb is to always, always, always cover the benzos um, because I feel like sometimes the seizure risk of those, data shows seizure risk with benzos is really high also. Phenobarbital will cover both alcohol and benzodiazepine for your seizure risk and help make the patient more comfortable. So I would recommend phenobarbital for both of those. How does benzo not pose a threat to an individual's detox from alcohol? When mixing benzos and alcohol together can be a deadly cocktail. Um, agree. And I don't use benzos when I detox somebody with benzo and alcohol addiction. I use phenobarbital. Okay. Can you speak to more recent withdrawal studies? The ones referenced were from 40s and 60s. I do not have any more information. There's little information on withdrawal studies in general. Just like there's little information with opioids treating pain, people just haven't studied it. It's not an area of interest. Hopefully, over the next few years, with the epidemics that we have, people will start to study some of those areas. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, please put them in at this time. Otherwise, just as a housekeeping rule, as we're waiting for any last-minute questions, uh, you will get a follow-up email after this webinar concludes within about an hour after we conclude you'll get uh, email with the subject line follow-up please remember to give us feedback on what you thought of this in the evaluation and if you need to complete the post test please do that we'll have a link for that in the email as well um, I think that that wraps it up so thank you so much for joining us today We'll be sending out that email. Thank you, Casey, for joining us. I hope that you all learned a great deal about detox and all of these very important notes on how to uh, properly do that with patients. Again, next month, we will be joined by Dr. Kaplan, and he will be talking about dual diagnosis. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.